Hi, I'm Maimon, and today I'm going to share with you what we learned while trying to fix our recently broken uh, oil fire burner. And if you also have an oil burner that's not working, and you're trying to figure it out, then maybe this video will help you. And as I've always said in my auto repair videos, it's usually easy to fix. The hard part is diagnosing the problem. Before I start this video, I just want to say that we've had this uh, burner for 11 years around that time, and it's been working well on us, and we haven't had a problem with it since. So this is our first experience trying to fix it. And back then, we had it replaced for around $3,500, and to replace it now would be around $5,000. So instead of paying that cost, we are trying to figure out what's wrong with it. So the basics of fire is that it needs air, fuel, and a source of ignition. So in this case, air is pre pretty irrelevant because I'm not sure you can tell, but there's air all around us. So that means first we have to check for if we have fuel, which is the oil. And we actually have a ton of fuel, so next we have to check if the fuel is actually getting to the burner. So uh, one problem that might arise with this is uh, that there might be air bubbles that pop up that block the oil from getting to the burner. So that, that means we have to bleed the system. And I actually already have a video on that. Um, we actually did it on this hot water heater, so I'll link it in the description below. And now, my dad is going to teach me and me his army. How to bleed the line. First, you loosen the screw uh, just a little. Then you attach this part to it. Now you put the holes in here. Then you put a tray and some cat litter in here just in case the oil sprays out. Uh, press this button for at least three seconds and then this Another thing you should check for when uh, checking the, if the oil gets to the burner is the oil filter. Now, they recommend that you replace the oil filter every once a year. However, we've only replaced it like once every few years. That's probably a bad idea. You probably shouldn't do that. But as for uh, replacing the oil filter, it's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is unscrew it. Um, and then you can see how dirty it is. We'll ha we have a picture of it, actually. And then you just replace it with a new filter. And then screw it back on. So we bled the system, and oil was getting to the pump. So we decided to check the igniter, which is this unit right here. So uh, we checked the spark, and although there was a spark, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really strong. It was uh, kind of weak. And this was the old igniter. So we actually decided to replace it with a new igniter, as seen here. Um, they're relatively cheap, around $40 to, uh, to be, 38 to be exact. but. Uh, we tested this one, we actually have a video on that, and it was very strong, as you'll see from the video. Oh. Shizami was here so he could explain, because he's an electrical genius. Installing the actual igniter is fairly easy. All you have to do is unscrew the control module, unscrew the, um, the... Uh, old igniter itself, and then you take the new igniter, and then you just hook up the two wires to it, and screw it in, and then you should be good to go. Um, I'm not going to show you how to install it, because it is fairly easy. It does come with instructions if you do need to know how to do it, and if you still need help, then there are tons of videos out there on how to install the igniter. Uh, besides, this video is about diagnosing, not about showing you. So, after diagnosing the igniter, there was still a spark, which means that uh, although it, there, it might have been part of the problem, it wasn't the main problem. So that means we directed our attention to the nozzle head, or the spray head. So let me just take this part out right here. Be careful with it. Right here. So it's this tiny little thing that looks like a hex nut with a, like, cone. And we decided to replace this, and basically what this does is it sends the oil out through it, and... Wait, let me digress here and explain how this works. So first off, the uh, oil goes through here, and then it gets shot out the nozzle head, so which is this part right here. And then these two electrodes, with the ones that have L and R on them, they shoot, they send the spark. And what that does is that as this oil goes out, it goes like, and then the fire comes out. So we decided to replace the nozzle head because it might have been dirty, and we actually have a picture of it. And it was dirty, so we blew through it to make sure it wasn't clogged. Uh, it wasn't clogged, 
But we decided to in to install a new one because it was cheap, you know, $7. And besides, you're actually supposed to replace these once a year. Um, so long for that 11 years of not working on this machine. So we decided to replace this, and when we replaced this, um, my dad thought that you'd have to take these two electrodes out. Uh, you actually don't have to if you have a regular wrench that can just unscrew the nozzle head. But my dad did take out the electrodes, so in order to put them back, you have to put these electrodes and the nozzle head back in a very um, precise way so that it fires... No, in a very accurate way so that it fires precisely, as seen on these instructions that came with the kit. So we actually bought this kit uh, at Home Depot for like $20, and Damn. it actually has extra insulators and uh, uh, electrodes. As for the electrodes themselves, uh, you probably won't need to replace them because they're just metal. They probably don't get broken easily. At the very least, you'll have to replace the insulators. Um, but in our case, we just had to replace the nozzle head. So we needed this instrument right here, the firing pin gauge, in order to make sure that it was precise. So, you know, there has to be a certain distance between the electrodes, and it has to be like, I think it was half an inch from the uh, nozzle head, as seen on these instructions. Now that we replaced the nozzle head, we decided to put it back in. Uh, let me just attempt to make sure. And then we ran the system again. So what happened is that it didn't work. So that baffled us entirely. So we decided to take it back out. We noticed that when we first took out this, um, uh, this part right here, this whole contraption, that there was oil dripping out of this part especially. However, when we took it out this time, there was no oil at all, which means that from the pump to the this part, there was no oil being supplied. So let me explain how this works, by the way. So the way it works is that, like I said, you need air, fuel, and a uh, spark. Of course, air is irrelevant, but the fuel comes from the pump, goes through this hose, and is supposed to enter into this pipe into the uh, nozzle head. The spark is supplied by the igniter, and when you close this, these two springs will come in, or coils will come into contact with the electrodes, which the electrodes will supply the spark. So when the spark is supplied, it comes into contact with the oil, and that creates fire. And that's how the burner works. Now, it didn't work when we tried to run the system. So if that done, we crossed out ignition as the problem. So that means we're left with the oil. And I already know the three basic elements of fire. However, because this is a machine, there has to be additional elements, and like I said before, the pump to send the oil into the nozzle head. But there's also the motor, which spins the pump in order to generate a PSI of 100 to 140 PSI in order to send this oil out. And all, the, the motor also, sent, uh, also forces air into the chamber, because like I said before, you need air for the fire. And there's also the uh, control module, which controls like the power and the uh, CAD cell, uh, but that's uh, something we don't need to go into in this video. We figured out that, so when we bled the uh, system, there was still oil coming out of here, so that means that there was nothing wrong with the pump. So that means there was something wrong from the pump to the nozzle head. Something was getting lost in transit. Okay, so we're going to demonstrate exactly what we're talking about. And before I start, let me just say, do, let me just give you a word of caution. Do not do this, uh, especially under normal circumstances, please. Because what we're going to do is we're going to turn the system on, and when this turns on, oil is going to be coming out of here at um, 140 PSI, and this nozzle, it says 0.8 gallons per hour, and that's only the nozzle. So if you imagine this big uh, hose right here, that's going to be more than that. So... You don't want oil shooting all over the place. So let me just talk about what we're going to do. What we're going to do to test the system is we're going to, first we're going to supply power, and then we're, by flicking that switch, and then we're going to, it's either going to run automatically or it's going to be in lockout. So lockout would have the, a green light right here, and if it is lockout, then we're going to press this red button. What should happen is that oil should flow through this hose into this bottle. And then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to close this um, bleeder valve, I guess you could say. In normal circumstances, what should happen is that oil should flow out of here. But since something is broken here, there should be no oil. So right now, we're going to demonstrate it. Like I said before, 
Don't try this at home. So there's no green light, which means it should start automatically. It's already, it's already loosened, by the way. As you can see, the oil is going to the bottom. Now we're going to tighten it. As you can see, no oil is coming out. All right, so as you saw there, oil uh, oil bled out of that uh, bleeder valve into the bottle. So this bleeder valve actually acts as a bypass so that if it's open, then the oil is actually going to flow here. But if it's closed, it's going to flow through the pump. So you, wrote, you may recall that earlier when I said uh, there are many components in this machine that there's also the motor. So we're also going to run this a second time so you can see that the uh, uh, motor is working so that it, you can tell that it's uh, supplying both air and it's spinning the pump. Well, you actually heard it earlier. <laughs> it doesn't take a genius to figure out that that whirring is the sound of the motor, but we're just gonna show you so you can see what it looks like. So we have rubber gloves right here and it might be lockout, so let's try it. Okay, no lockout, so let me open this up. Don't touch these, they're gonna be high voltage. Oh wait, this has to... Wait, this has to start first and then we open it, right? All right, attempt number two. I hope it doesn't like malfunction from dry firing it. Wait a second. Oh, it entered lockout because this was open. All right, so we're gonna close that. Make sure we don't, it's not dangerous, and turn it off. Alright, so up to this point, it, it might have been hard to follow up with what I was saying, especially since I'm explaining it, because I'm supposed to be the, mecha the mechanical guy in our family. Azami's more of the electrical engineer type, and he should really be the one explaining this, especially because he's the MIT electrical engineer, and I'm really happy for him, but <laughs> he's sleeping right now. So basically, trying to explain what just happened is... First, there's a few seconds of delay for the CAD cell, which is this one, to c sense complete darkness in order for the system to start running. Once it does that, the motor will start spinning to supply the pump with pressure, uh, you know, build up that 100 to 140 uh, uh, PSI. It takes around uh, 15 seconds for this to happen, and then after that, it's going to supply uh, a mechanism and the pump's going to open that supplies oil to the uh, nozzle. After a few seconds, if the system doesn't uh, sense any spark, which is either due to lack of ignition or lack of um, um, fuel, then it will automatically shut off. It's a safety feature uh, that prevents uh, over flooding of fuel or burnout. The first thing that my dad did when he noticed the problem was he bled the system. So he noticed that the oil was still gush, uh, gushing out into the bottle at a high rate because he was trying to see if there was uh, if there wasn't enough pressure. So there was enough pressure; it was gushing out at a fast rate. So he assumed that the problem wasn't the pump. However, my dad uh, missed one crucial part of the problem. There's another component to the pump. Right here is a solenoid. And it's a, it's a magnetic part that when it activates, it pulls up a mechanism that allows the oil to go through. The way the solenoid works is that after the 15 seconds of building up the pressure for the pump is over, it's going to, let's say, open the gates so that the oil can flood through, through the hose and into the firing gun. In order to test out the steering, if the solenoid is broken, what we're going to do is we're going to unhook the wire, which we already have, or the cable. And then we're going to use our multimeter, and I say this begrudgingly because this is a zombie's favorite tool, to test if power is actually being supplied. Uh, uh, Alright, let me, let me step back. Um, it's a bit late at night, and let me just correct myself. Uh, I said that we were testing for power. We're actually testing for continuity. So we're going to be looking for if... Uh, if this has the right amount of resistance. And according to research, it ha should have around 440 ohms. So right now, we have it set to that uh, mode. So now we're going to test the continuity. So you can see there are three pins. The top one is ground, don't worry about that. 
And as you can see, there's no like beeping or anything. And when we look at the multimeter, let me move that to the side, that there's no continuity. So if we tried to make sure that like on a oh, on a separate uh, piece of metal, like these two bolts. You can see that there is continuity. So that means that the solenoid isn't working. We finally found our problem. <laughs> so what's happening here is that because there's no power being supplied, uh, no, because power is not, because there's no continuity, this channel doesn't open. And that means that because this gate is closed, the oil will not go through. So it's stuck in this closed position, and that means oil cannot be supplied to the firing gun. So that means we have to, to replace the solenoid. Now, online forums, uh, research has said that uh, you can either buy it with the, the relay by itself, which is should be around $20, or with the pump, which should be around $80. However, it's a Sunday, which means that no good plumbing stores are open, usually. And if you order online from Amazon, it's going to take two days, so it's going to arrive on Wednesday. And I don't know about you, but I can't go that long without without heat. And as for the pump, it's even though it's been 11 years, pumps don't break often, except on Priuses. So we should be good with the pumps, but all we have to do is replace the solenoid. So that's it. All right, so when we replace that solenoid, assuming that my dad has installed the firing gun correctly, it should work. And actually with better efficiency because we replaced a lot of the other parts, you know, like the, like the nozzle head and the oil filter. And I think there's one more other part that we replaced. Um, or is it? <laughs> oh yeah, we also replaced the igniter. <sighs> it's a late night, but we should be, we should be running at a better efficiency. So that's it. I'm Aymon and thanks for watching. Please like, like, comment, subscribe, and look at our videos on I and Aymon and, uh, I can't think of anything else, but I'll see you next time. Signing out. Whew. Peace. <laughs>